Hey, how are you doing? Uh, this is Craig Beck from StopDrinkingExpert.com. Welcome into another live stream and uh, slightly later today. I'm just playing about with times to see uh, what works best for everyone. Um, I downloaded this software that analyzes my YouTube and it came up with a suggestion as the best time for me to do live streams. It said mid midnight was the optimum time. <laughs> so, yeah. Whatever. Uh, so I've nudged it two hours forward to see how that works out. Um, welcome on in. It is the usual meeting. Um, this is basically like an AA meeting for problem drinkers who don't want to go and sit in a church hall and talk about God and have the big book read to them. So I just think it's helpful for us to get together on a regular basis just to remind each other that we've made this choice and life is better without alcohol in it. You can ask me anything today. You got any questions at all about alcohol, about quitting, about staying sober, about falling off the wagon, about relapse, whatever is on your mind, you can post the comment below. Uh, if you want to come on as a live guest, you can do that as well and get some free one-to-one -one coaching. Just go to that link at the bottom of your screen down there, stopdrinkingexpert.com forward slash live. Uh, you can choose whether to use your camera or not. You can just come on audio only if you prefer. It would be nice to see you if you do come on, but it's, that's totally up to you, I understand. Uh, so I will say hello to a few people in just a moment. Uh, as, uh, no, as usual, I uh, bring along something to talk about just to get us going. Um, hi, KB, joining from Arizona. Uh, it, what time is it there, KB? Is it like really early in the morning? Uh, so this is what I wanted to talk about today. Is alcoholism hereditary? And I've just posted up an ultimate guide on my blog at the website, stopdrinkingexpert.com. Uh, if you want me to kind of summarize this very long article in a very short sentence, is alcoholism hereditary? Uh, kind of is the answer. There is some evidence to suggest that um, genetics play a part in it, and that if you're um, if you come from a family of drinkers, there is a chance that you will also be a drinker. Uh, personally, I, I tend to lean towards thinking that this is more about social conditioning than it is genetics. Uh, I think it's much more powerful um, to have grown up in an alcoholic household and observed it and kind of soaked up that, that mentality. I think that is much more likely to be the cause of your problem drinking than genetics. Um, it's called social conditioning, basically, you know, and the human mind is a, is a funny thing. Before the age of seven, you can pretty much tell a child anything you want and they'll believe you. Not only that, you can demonstrate to a child that this is this is normal, this is what you should be doing, and they will take it as read. They won't question it. Because before the age of seven, we don't really have that critical thinking available to us. We don't have that ability to question what we're seeing or what we're being told. Plus, you know, we tend to look at our parents like godlike figures. We haven't had much interaction with other human beings, and so we've got no reason to question what our primary caregivers are saying to us. That's why you can, you know, you can tell a child that the Easter bunny exists and that Father Christmas comes down the chimney every year and leaves presents and that sort of stuff. They believe it because they've got no reason not to believe it. Why, why would they question it? Now, unfortunately, if you grow up as a young child with parents who used alcohol routinely, you observed this behavior and you took it as read. You didn't question it. And so subconsciously, you have learned at quite a deep and profound level that when you're stressed, alcohol helps. When you've had a hard day at work, alcohol helps. When the car won't start, alcohol helps. When you want to celebrate, alcohol, and so on and so on and so on. So I think it's much more likely that uh, your social conditioning plays a role in your current problem than genetics. Let's say hello to a few people before I get 7 a.m. in Arizona. That's not too bad. That's not too bad. I thought it was crazy early there. Uh, Maria, hello from Greece. Ah, very nice. Which part of Greece? Uh, Christina L., uh, welcome on. Uh, Christine L., sorry, welcome in. Slavi is here. Good morning to you, Craig. Greetings from California. Woke up at 4 a.m., but you came on at 6 a.m. instead. <laughs> sorry. I hope you didn't set your alarm just for me. 
Yeah, I'm trying to do it a little bit later. It's, it's you know, it's impossible, Slabby, trying to do this at the right time for everyone. And to be honest with you, I just, I happen to live in the worst part of the world for time zone because pretty much nobody else is on my time zone, unless I think South Africa is the same, is the same time zone as me. So it makes it super tough for uh, my American viewers, I know. Uh, Maria is here. Uh, we've got Lee Volmer. Uh, Virginia, Lee, I saw your question. I'll come back to it, I promise. Uh, Virginia is here from Western Australia. What time is it there, uh, Virginia? And also Maria. Uh, oh, Maria's in Athens in a snowstorm. It's crazy, isn't it, Maria? It's, uh, it's three degrees in Cyprus. Normally, it's like 10 or 12 this time of year, three degrees, and like down to one or two overnight. It's really cold this year. Crazy. So let me just jump back to this, this uh, article that I've posted up today about... Um, is alcoholism hereditary? Look, this this is a question I get asked quite a lot. Um, it's not something you should spend a lot of time thinking about or researching. I'll tell you why. Because if you get the answer that you want, which is yes, alcohol is al is hereditary, it kind of it can put you into victim mode. It can make you kind of feel that it's not your fault. And therefore, you, you're you just doing what comes naturally. Therefore, you just carry on drinking. Because you're like, oh, it's not my fault. It's my, you know, it's my parents that gave me these bad genes. You know, what am I going to do? I'm coping as best I can. I can't ignore the genetics. It kind of gives you an excuse to be a victim. Um, you know, it's like if you, if you picked up anything else genetically. If you had, um, uh, you know, if you got diabetes or something because of a genetic link in your family, there's a tendency to go, well, there's nothing I can do about it because it's, you know, it's just in our family. That's, that's how it goes and shrug. And you can even have a little pity party about it. You can tell people, oh, you know, I've got, got this problem, but it's not my fault. You know, I didn't ask to be born like this, but you know, da, 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 and so on and so on. And these pity parties will get you attention and maybe a bit of sympathy, but that's it. And nobody ever, you know, progressed in life and made a success of themselves because they had a load of sympathy. Sympathy is, is worthless because most of the time it's fake anyway. You know, <laughs> I'm sorry, but the harsh reality is, especially on social media, at least half your friends on social media are glad when you have problems. The other half don't care. It's that bleak. So let's not get wrapped up in reasons why and excuses for our drinking. Hey, we ended up in this situation and that's where we are. So you can have a look at that. It's on the website, uh, The Ultimate Guide to Is Alcoholism Hereditary? I wouldn't spend too long on it, though, because <laughs> it won't serve you. Let's have a look at some questions here and say hello to a few people. Um, Brittany's in New Mexico, uh, going on three months sober. You superstar. Well done. Uh, Virginia, thank you for these regular sessions. Uh, this is what just what your community needs. Um, 10 past 10 where you are, Virginia, in Australia. That, that kind of feels okay. It's not ridiculous. It's not like two in the morning. Um, Johnny Cola says, I don't think it is inherited. My granddad stopped drinking at 42, uh, never touched another drop the rest of his life. Yeah. There are some strange things about the genders when it comes to alcohol. For example, women are, not, uh, are normally more likely to develop a problem after the, the age of 40. They can be absolutely fine up until the age of kind of 40, middle age, and then suddenly they can develop a problem into later life. Whereas men, it's the other way around. Uh, if, a, if a man has got to his 40s without ever having a problem with alcohol, there's a good chance he won't. Alcohol problems in men tend to develop earlier and later with women. I think probably skewing that figure slightly is that women have, uh, have to deal with empty nest syndrome. You know, when the kids leave home, there's that shock of like, what's my purpose in life now? What am I supposed to be doing? It's quite painful and difficult to deal with. And so alcohol is often uh, thought of as a solution. Uh, let's have a look at these questions here. Uh, Lee, here we go. Lee, why can some people stop at two drinks? Some need a 50 gallon drum. The very that's a very common question I got asked that people say to me, Craig, if you know you if alcohol's so addictive, and it is, it's the second most addictive substance on planet Earth, just behind heroin. Um, doesn't matter that it's available in Walmart, it's still a very nasty, evil drug that knows exactly what it's doing. But people say, 
if it's so addictive, Craig, how come I'm addicted to alcohol, but my friend isn't and none of my other friends are and so on and so on and so on. The, the answer to that is quite broad and difficult to pin down, but there are, there are many reasons for it. Firstly, it takes quite a lot of effort, commitment, passion, and money to develop a drinking problem. You don't, you don't drink heavily for a week and then you've got a drinking problem. You don't even drink heavily for a year and then you've got a drinking problem. It takes decades often before you get to the point where alcohol starts to destroy your life. This is why this drug is so dangerous because it's not, you know, you start taking heroin and very, very quickly your life is going to start collapsing around you. You can take alcohol and hold down a job, hold down a family, be a father, be a mother for decades before the evil clown goes, okay, now it's time to play. Let's start destroying your body, your mind, your finances, everything. So it's a bit like quicksand, you know? And sometimes people walk into that quicksand and they feel themselves sinking and it scares them and they back away. They go, whoa, I don't want to go down there. That's That feels a bit scary. Whereas other people persevere and they keep walking and walking and walking until they get to the middle of the quicksand and then they start sinking and it's too late by this point. Also, I would say that 95% of the people who come to me for help with their problem drinking are just covering up a bigger problem with their drinking. The drinking is almost never the problem, Lee. It's always a symptom of a bigger problem. They're using it as a, you know, a catch-all, like a, a panacea. So they could have pain in their life from trauma. They could be depressed. They could have anxiety. They could be in a bad relationship. They could be lonely. They could be depressed and so on and so on and so on. And they're using alcohol to make that pain go away. They're using it as, you know, a solution to a problem. It's a very poor solution, as I'm sure you already know, because it gives you bigger problems than you started with. But other people have different coping mechanisms. Other people don't choose alcohol as the solution to their problems. That doesn't mean that they all the other people are choosing healthy paths. They could, you know, they could have other issues. They could be using food as a solution. They could be gambling as a solution. They could be exercising to excess, you know, being hooked on exercise as a solution. Or they could have a more healthy way of dealing with stress and problems in their life. So that's one reason. The the other reason is some people just don't like the taste of it. Some people can't get away from it. They can taste how horrible it tastes right from the start, and they never kind of get used to it. So they'll have one or two drinks to be sociable, but it's it's not something that they crave or want to, want to do when they're on their own because they don't really like the taste of it, if you know what I mean. So there's that as well. Um, and just for good measure, I'll give you another reason as well. Some people just don't have a reaction the way that you know, we do. When they drink it, not much happens. They don't get a strong sense of euphoria. They don't get a buzz. They don't feel silly. They don't feel happy. They don't feel much of anything, really. They, just, they feel a bit bad the next day. So some people, and I guess a lot of people watching this, this stream would fit into this category, when, when they first drank or when they started drinking, it, it lit them up, you know, that euphoria, that buzz, whatever it gave us was really strong and powerful. And for other people, they don't get that, lucky buggers. So they genuinely can just have one glass of wine out of a bottle and then put it back in the fridge. They, they don't think of it like that, you know? So I hope that helps. There are many reasons, basically, is what I'm saying. Um, what have we got here? Uh, Brittany says, 10 past 7 in the morning here. Okay. That's, again, not too bad. Um Families just tend to share the same strengths and weaknesses we define ourselves, though. Yeah, true. Um, there's, there's kind of three phases of uh, psychological development. You know, it starts with that, uh, like, sponge phase up, up to about the age of seven, where we just absorb information. And then the second phase is we're starting to look for uh, good examples. We're looking for heroes and heroines. So, you know, in this second age of childhood, after seven to kind of early teens, 
it's not unusual for a son to think that his dad is the strongest, the fastest, the best, you know, the, the ultimate. Kids go to school and they have arguments and fights about whose dad could beat up who, you know, the other kid's dad and all that stuff. There's the kind of hero worship their parents and other significant others. And then there's that kind of after they reach early teenage years, there's the opposite comes about. They start looking outside the bubble of the family home and start looking into the, out to the big world and looking for their, uh, you know, their examples from outside rather than inside. And at this point, dad sucks and mom sucks. And they're starting to aspire to be like external people. All very fascinating. Um, and it's good to know it. But, uh, you know, that, that formative period, naught to seven, is really significant if you live with a mother or father or drinks. You pick up some really bad programming during those years. Uh, if you just joined us, uh, welcome on in. Uh, let me know what you think about this time. I've moved it two hours later to see if that's better for people. Um, if it's worse, please tell me and I'll move it again. But uh, do tell me what you think. And don't forget, this is an Ask Me Anything, so you can post up any question you want, whether you're thinking about quitting, whether you're in the process of doing it, whether you're long-term sober, if you want to share your tips, secrets, and stories, then you can do that as well. You can even come on with me live using the link at the bottom of your screen. Um, anything you want. And I'll stay on here as long as I can and as long as the questions keep coming. Uh, I guess we'll reach a natural end at some point. Hi, Kev. Kev is on board. Thank you, Kev, and welcome. Um, Sheil, um, when you drink the liver is... Let's have a look at this. When you drink, the, is the liver then busy with breaking down the alcohol and has no time for breaking down fat, so you get fat. Uh, Sheil, the, the problem with alcohol, um, you know, is not so much the calories in the in the alcohol, although that does play a role when you see guys with the big beer bellies. Um, you know, sometimes people will drink vodka because they say that it has the least calories. It's kind of irrelevant, really. The problem with alcohol is it's liquid fuel. It's like gasoline. And so, but it, it's also a poison. So your body has to make a choice. It's got, it's kind of, got, it's got several sources of fuel that it can draw upon. It can use the food that you have in your stomach that you've just eaten. It can metabolize that into glycogen to fuel your muscles. Or it can, if there's no food available in your stomach, it can draw from your fat stores and convert that, uh, or it can take from your muscles if it wants to. But if it has a liquid fuel already available in your system and it's a poison, it's in your body's interest to use that first. So the problem here is that your body never, if, you're, if you've got alcohol in your system every day, your body never really has an opportunity to burn the fat because why would it? It's got a much easier form of fuel available in liquid form in your bloodstream immediately. So it will always burn the alcohol first. And that's often compounded by the fact that often people drink and eat at the same time. So if you have a three course meal with a bottle of wine and then a brandy afterwards and whatever and whatever, it's it's kind of like domino effect. You know, it's you've got all this food, high calorie, sitting in your stomach, your body doesn't need it because it has fuel available. So it can't just leave it there to rot and ferment in your stomach. So it has to do something with it. So it converts it to fat. So it's not really that your liver is too busy um, to burn fat. It's just that it, it has an easier source of fuel, if that makes sense. The other thing that um, alcohol does is and the reason I say to people, you only get one choice on whether you drink or not, and that will be on the first drink. Because after you take the first glass of alcohol, the first thing alcohol does is it goes into your brain and interferes with the part of your brain responsible for making sound and logical decisions. It also affects your satiety control. So the alcohol wants you to drink and drink and drink and drink, even though you're not thirsty. So it has to switch off that part of your brain that says to you, you're full or you're, you're not thirsty anymore. Because if you think about it, it's not it's not really logical to go and drink 10 pints of fluid, is it? I mean, how thirsty would you have to be to need 10 pints of orange juice to quench your thirst? And yet we'll go to a bar and sit and drink 10 pints of beer. You see what I mean? You're not thirsty. 
but the alcohol has switched off the part of your brain that tells you that you're not thirsty. Unfortunately, the byproduct of that is it also switches off the part of your brain that tells you that you're full. That's why you can have a three course meal and then two hours later send out for McDonald's or go and buy a big bag of chips and sit in front of the TV eating all night because you just cast this insatiable appetite. So it's multi-leveled shield. Uh, so I hope that helps. Um, it's not good news, <laughs> basically. Jem's here. Hi, Jem. Hi, Craig. I stopped for a, over a year, but now I'm in a relationship and started drinking again. Uh, she hates it because she says it changes me. I need to stop again because I'm drinking in secret now, Howard. Yeah. Uh, I always say that if you've got alcohol in your relationship, the, you, you've got three people in your relationship. So it's like having an affair, really, because the drinker will make choices that are not in the interests of their partner, but in the interests of the evil clown. Often the drinker will make a decision to do something or to act a certain way or to go a certain place because it facil facilitates their drinking, not because it's the best thing to do for their partner. So it does make you a significantly less connected partner. You, are, you have three people in your relationships. You have your partner, you have yourself, and you have the drug. And the drug is going to win a lot of the battles for your time, energy, effort, and money. So I, I think, you know, this is all about mindset, Gem. You've done it before. It is somewhat harder to do it again after a relapse because the evidence you had before is weaker now. But this is, a, this is a, about drawing a line in the sand and making a decision and looking at what alcohol, just step back for a moment and think about this. What is alcohol giving you versus what it's stealing from you? And it's, it's a, there has to be like a light switch moment where you go, I, I don't want this anymore. I just do not want this anymore. And that has to be the catalyst. That has to be the moment where you, you make a change. And, you know, that's why I'm doing these online meetings because I think, Everyone's at a different stage in this journey, but the one thing I know for sure is, is it makes a big difference to feel like you're not alone, that you're not the only one going through this. And just to have this regular interaction where we catch up and meet, I think is helpful. Maybe I'm wrong, I don't know, but I'm giving it a go because I think it has value. Um, look, you, you made that decision before. You can do it again. You just need to, you need to sit down and have a little word with yourself and work out when you're going to do it because you will do it at some point it, it's it's inevitable just don't make sure that you, you're not doing it because life forced your hand because your partner found out and left you make that decision today you've done it you know you can do this <laughs> owen feels like a genius when he's drinking yeah i know what you mean i remember i tell a story about uh i'm the um how i became nearly the stupidest millionaire in the world. I remember being on a flight once and um, I was drunk. I was, I was off my face. And um, in the, it was a long flight and it was like 10 hours. And in the middle of this flight, I came up with a business idea. And I can't even remember what it was now, but it, it, was, I, it was like I was Einstein. I, I, I was so excited by this idea. I typed up this business presentation uh, I spent hours on it on this flight, typing, typing, typing. I was, I was like, oh my god, I'm going to be a millionaire. This is the best idea ever. This is the most amazing business venture, and I even know who I'm going to get involved in it. I know the professionals I'm going to bring on board. And thank God, this was back in the days before Wi-Fi on planes, because if I'd had access to email or video calls, I would have made a huge fool of myself. Because when I landed and sobered up. I opened my laptop to look excitedly at this business plan that I'd created, and it was gibberish. I mean, it was it was embarrassing. It was it wasn't even English. It was just random words. It was the it was the ramblings of an imbecile. It wasn't just a bad business idea. It wasn't even a business. It was just like it was just like a gibbering fool. Had banged the keyboard with his palm for four hours. 
And so I know what you mean. I thought I was the biggest genius in the world. I thought I was going to be a millionaire from this idea. It was absolutely nonsensical. Uh, Slavi, uh, you're right, Craig. It doesn't matter if it's hereditary or not. What matters is getting into acceptance as fast as possible uh, to start the healing process. Don't get stuck in denial, anger, blame, and shame. True, really true. Uh, because excuses don't get you anything. They, in every area of life, you know? Um, and sometimes you'll be really justified in your excuse. Sometimes something will have happened to you in life that's really bad and it wasn't your fault and it's horrible and you can tell people about that and they'll feel sorry for you but what does that get you it doesn't get you anything does it? it gets you nothing at all so what's the point might as well just suck it up get on with it a bit blunt i know but that's that's me um uh, light says to answer your question yes yeah you can blame your parents for everything if it wasn't for them, you wouldn't be born. <laughs> so are you really angry at your parents? <laughs> um, Edmund, I've stopped drinking a month ago, but can't socialize. Will that disappear? What do you mean you can't socialize, Edmund? You mean uh, you are too tempted to go to a bar or you don't like going to bars anymore or you don't feel uh, socially confident? Give me a bit more uh, meat on the bones on that one, and we'll talk about it. Uh, Maria, after one year sober, craving wine again, please help. Look, this happens, Maria, and it's, you know, one year is, is quite a pivotal moment. Uh, and it's good that you're reaching out at this point because a lot of people just crumble here. Um, there seems to be this, um, this kind of end of honeymoon period, and it's around one year. Um, where you look back and you can't really remember or how bad alcohol made you feel. You, it's, it's there, but it's, it doesn't hurt as much anymore. It's a distant memory. But what you can remember are the good times. You can, you can remember meals and uh, social occasions and things like that. And there's this, this voice in your head that says, look, you quit pretty easily the first time. You can probably do it again. Just one drink won't hurt. Um, and, you know, and that's why I say that those are the five most dangerous words on planet Earth. Just one drink won't hurt. And if you ever find yourself saying that to yourself, punch yourself in the face as hard as you can. Because that's the last thing you're going to hear before something very bad happens. Maria, it's, it's an illusion. And if you respond to that voice with just one drink won't hurt and you have a glass of wine, it could take you months to get back out of this cycle. You'll go straight back into the misery that you've almost forgotten about. And so that's why I encourage people to make a day one video. You know, on the day that you quit drinking, get your phone out, re record a selfie video, explain to yourself in graphic detail why you should never drink again. And don't, you know, don't pull the punches, twist the knife, stick it in, twist the knife until the blade breaks off. You've got to explain to yourself in exquisite, painful detail why alcohol should never be in your life. Because you can listen to people like me, you can read the good books, you can watch, you know, videos online and stuff like that. Uh, but you can argue with me. You can say, no, 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 I'm not having that, Craig. But you can't argue with yourself. That's just insane. So... Um, you just gotta you gotta redouble your passion, Maria. After one year, you know, quitting drinking is something you left in the past. Now you're living a sober life. You're not every day is not like a passionate battle to quit drinking. You you it's just become you know part of who you are, and you, you need to bring that passion back a little bit. And attending these meetings on a regular basis will help. Start reading again about this. Start refreshing your belief structure around this drug. Uh, if new ideas, new points of view. Um, but bring the passion back. you got to go back to where you were when you hated this drug and you had to get away from it. Uh, KB, uh, it's also possible that some of your friends only appear to stop at two drinks, but they go off and uh, f uh, home and finish a bottle. True. And you know what? This is um, alcoholism. Problem drinking is an iceberg. It, it's so much bigger 
than anyone's willing to accept. I'm, there are, I know dozens of people who claim not to really like alcohol. They say, oh, I can take it or leave it. I, don't, I have the odd pint. I have the odd glass of wine. And other people who know them have said, you know, that's not true, don't you? They drink every night. They, you, you should see their recycling bin every week, piling over with bottles. So you're right. A lot of people are hiding this. And for us non-alcoholics, us problem drinkers who are psychologically addicted rather than physically addicted, it is quite easy to hide this. Maybe not from your partner because they see what's going on behind closed doors, but I hid it uh, from my colleagues and my family for you know probably 15 years. People just thought I liked to drink. People thought I was a you know life and soul of the party. Uh, they didn't know that alcohol was destroying me in every sense of the word because I hid it. I never missed work, never got arrested, never got a DUI. Just used to drink every night, and that's it. Boris Johnson, uh, or Johnson seems to handle a poison well. Do you think? <laughs> Do you think he's getting away with it? <laughs> because he he talks shit and he looks like shit. So, okay. Um, Christine, uh, day seven alcohol free, second time around. First time I did 18 months. I substituted alcohol for cigarettes, gave up smoking, and then got addicted to alcohol. I'm in Cornwall, England. Uh, yeah. You know what that says to me, Christine? Uh, it says there's something under the alcohol. There's an issue you're not, you've not dealt with underneath um, the alcohol in the cigarettes. And that is what we call a dry drunk. It is someone who is uh, sober, but they're unhappy because there's something causing them a problem. And so far, they haven't dealt with it. And that can be one of many reasons. Firstly, it's too painful to deal with it. So they find some substitute to try and cover it up. Or two, they don't know what it is. Something traumatic happened when you were a child and you re it was so horrible, you repressed it and it's in the back of your head, but you don't know what it is. Um, or you do know what it is, um, but you don't want to deal with it. And as long as that kind of problem is there and you don't deal with it you're always going to look for a coping mechanism and more often than not because this is a, a negative act as in ignoring a problem your coping mechanism mechanism is going to be negative so what i would say to you is this if you know what your problem is if you know what causes you your down moments your dark moments what causes you pain and fear and worry uh, then go and deal with it go and get some therapy Find a therapist that works for you and a system that works for you and deal with it. If you don't know what it is, go and do something like timeline therapy or where they take you back through time and allow you to kind of observe your life as though you're floating above it, like it's a play on a stage. So you see it, but you're kind of detached from all the emotions. Okay, you'll find a timeline therapist in Cornwall, I'm sure. Uh... JR still at work with the pods. What are the pods, JR? I'm, I'm being stupid. Jan's in Perth. Welcome, Jan. Thank you very much. Uh, Slavi says the time is this time is better because it's 6 a.m. rather than 4 a.m. <laughs> yeah, it sounds a lot better. Um, Christine says easier to give up smoking than alcohol. You know, it, it depends. I hear people, I hear smokers tell me that it, oh, smoking's the worst drug in the world to get off. And I hear alcohol, you know, drinkers say the same thing. Um, so I don't know. I can't really comment because I've never really smoked. Smoked for about two weeks in school. Um, it never really caught on with me. Uh, Virginia says, I don't have empty nest syndrome. I've got no kids at 52 years old. It's just crept up on me. I'm an introvert, even though I'm married. Sadly, also to a problem drinker. Codependency, it's called. Yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. I, I'm an introvert. Um, and, and people are shocked when I say that sometimes, because obviously, you know, you sit on YouTube talking if you're an introvert. I think people are confused about what the definition of an introvert is. It's for me, you define it like this. What is your default position at the end of the day? After you finish work, what do you want to do? 
Do you want to go out and be sociable? Do you want to party? Or do you want to go home and be on your own and be quiet and just have a bit of your own company? If it's the latter, then you're probably more of an introvert than an extrovert. Uh, and I am what you, I think what you could call an, um, an extroverted introvert in that I can turn it on when I need to. I can stand on the stage and talk and I can present. But that's that's because I spent 20 years as a broadcaster. Um, yeah, you've got to fill your life with with value, uh, Virginia. You've got to find what you're passionate about and do it. The stuff that you used to do as a kid, but just because you wanted to, from a time when you didn't consider how much money it would make you or how you know how far up the career ladder it would get you or whatever. The stuff you used to do because you just loved it, that's what you got to bring in and do it. Be more playful. Um, speaking of social conditioning by our parents, my dad used to give me his olive from his martini when he was done. I was probably age five. Yeah. My grandparents used to give me cider, you know, like five, 6% proof cider when I was about seven years old because they said it was only apple juice. Oh, it won't do him any harm. I wonder where my problem started, eh? Um, Mateus, three weeks sober, already lost three kilograms. Fantastic. You're not drinking liquid sugar anymore, liquid uh, liquid fuel. Um, once uh, Slavi says, exactly, once I knew, believed, that there is no benefit in using this attractively packaged poison, the feeling of wanting to drink fades away. Yeah. Once you start looking at alcohol and seeing the negatives much brighter and more colorful than the positives, you, 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 the sensation is this, you, you kind of, you're at a party, everyone's drinking champagne and just briefly you look and you go, ah, oh, I kind of feel like I'm missing out. And then a much bigger part of your brain reminds you of all the energy, love and everything that it sucked out of your life. And you remember that time you go, oh, that was horrible. Why would I want to go back there? And then, then it's over. As long as you're in that mindset, as long as that's your belief structure, that alcohol causes you so much more pain than it gives you pleasure then it's just, it, sometimes it's irritating, but it, stay in that mindset and it gets a lot easier. I'm sure I'm missing a lot of people here who I should have said hello to, forgive me. Um, Kat Obi, Kat, uh, hi from Michigan. You are so darn logical. One trick, don't keep track of time. Don't keep track of time of last drink. Okay, yes. Suddenly your head says, oh, it's been a month, a year, etc. I can handle one. <laughs> Is me being logical a good thing or a bad thing in your point of view, uh, Kat? I am logical. That's, that's why uh, AA didn't work for me. Because it, it's not logical to me. You know, here, here's a room full of people who are all told that they're They've got a problem and they always will have a problem. They're, they're broken and they always will be broken. But they're so broken and so weak that they can't even fix their problem. They have to give it to God. They have to give it to a higher power. And there's no logic in that. That, that doesn't make sense to me. So that's why it didn't work for me. Um, and that's a good tip on the time thing. And I do say to people, don't count the days. Because you're making alcohol more more important than it needs to be. I mean, you don't do that with other stuff, do you? You don't go you don't go around telling people, "Oh, you know, it's five days since I had a potato." Why? Because you don't care enough to count it, do you? And, and you know, and what would people think if you told them that? They wouldn't. They wouldn't say, "Oh, you know, have you heard about Craig? He's really in control of his potato use." They'd say, "Have you heard about Craig? I think he's got a bit of a problem with potatoes." So counting is not a good idea, I don't think. David, why do I only have the urge to drink right after work? I'm perfectly fine during the morning or afternoon. Well, it's uh, cycles, David. Um, it's the same for me. I and I used to reassure myself that I didn't have a problem because, A, uh, never used to want to drink in the morning. And everyone knows alcoholics get up and drink, don't they? So that couldn't be an alcoholic. I never used to sneak off to the men's room at work and swig vodka or something like that. My drinking was in a loop. I'd get home from work, six o'clock at night, take my coat off, open the first bottle of wine. Second bottle of wine, and I'd drink 90% of the second bottle of wine, throw the rest down the sink. Why? 
So I could lie with confidence to my wife when she would say to me, did you drink two bottles of wine again? I'd say, no, I drank one. And I started on the second, but I didn't finish it. So I used to throw, <laughs> how stupid is this? I used to throw away a bit of wine so I could lie with plausible deniability to my wife. But alcohol um, basically uses carrot and stick, David. So about 24 hours after you drank, the alcohol is going to in induce a bit of withdrawal. And you're gonna you're gonna recognize it as a feeling of mild anxiety, but you won't you won't put the two things together generally. You won't go, oh, I'm feeling mild anxiety because now I'm suffering from alcohol withdrawal. We don't think like that. We get home from work and we go, oh, what a day. Oh, the boss is such an ass. Oh, I'm so stressed. And you pour the first glass of wine, don't you, David, or beer, whatever you drink, and you and you drink it and you go, ah. Oh, that's better. But have you noticed something, David? When you take the second drink of your wine, you don't get an ah. On the second one, you don't go, ah, oh, I feel even better. And the third one, ah, oh, you only get a ah, that feels better on the first one. Why? Here's your answer. You are being rewarded by the drug for doing as you were told, for being a good boy and complying. It gave you that sensation of anxiety as a withdrawal so that you would act in the way that you know to deal with anxiety, drinking. And then when you drank, it took away that sensation of anxiety as a reward for your compliance. Now, if you just had one drink, you would slowly feel that Anxiety coming back, that, that jittery sensation that we vocalize as, ooh, I could do with a drink. So the reason you want to drink every night in the same time is because you're in a loop. And this is how the drug gets you. You're in a loop that it, it will reset every day, roughly around the same time as you normally drink. Also, it's like Pavlov and his dogs. You are creating physical pieces of meat inside your head to facilitate your drinking in that environment. I talk about this on my online course. You know, I used to drink in my lazy boy armchair. I used to recline in my armchair, put the TV on, and I'd sit there, bottle of wine, glass of wine, drinking, watching TV. So when I was stopping drinking, where was the worst place for me to be? In that armchair. Because it's like Pavlov ringing the bell for the dogs. All these emotions and triggers and anchors are firing off because I'm physically activating them by being in the same location that I, I prefer to be in. I hope that helps. How long have we been going? 43 minutes. We'll do another five or 10 minutes. Um, don't forget, three times a week, live sessions. If you just joined in, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. If you're new to the channel, like and add a comment below so I know what you're up to and where you are. Let's say hello to Davey and wish him well and congratulate him on 20 days going strong. You got this, Davey. Well done. Uh, Todd Parker, 25 months, alcohol-free. I realize now the key to happiness is gratitude, and I'm grateful for you. Thank you. Absolutely, Todd. Um, there's always a reason to be grateful. Onel, uh, good morning. Having issues learning how to stop drinking. I don't know where to start. Well, you kind of have started. You're here, which is a good thing. Keep coming back. Um, the, the best thing you can do is go and sign up for the free webinar later on today, uh, and I'll talk you through the process. Uh, it would take me about 45 minutes to do it here, uh, to talk you through the kind of how you start and the, and the concept of why it works. Um, most people want to do this on their own because, A, you feel like you should be able to do it on your own. We're, we're not weaklings, are we? Uh, and, B, it feels kind of embarrassing. There's some stigma around this drug. And see, there's some doubt as well. How can someone else help me stop drinking? What, what are they going to whisper a secret in my ear? So I understand that because I spent, you know, five years trying everything to stop drinking on my own before I before the penny dropped for me. Um, there's no shame in asking for help. Um, give it a go. Go to the webinar and see what you think, yeah? 
And as Dirty Sasha says, read Craig's free book. If you go to the webinar, I'll send you a copy of my book free just as a thank you for coming along, all right? Uh, Todd, how do you feel about weed? I'm kind of a... Um, how do I feel about weed? I, I kind of think it should be legal. I, d I don't think it's as evil as alcohol. I don't think it's as evil as nicotine. It seems kind of strange that nicotine and alcohol are legal and weed isn't. The only negative thing I would say about weed and other drugs, Todd, is, uh, like I said right at the start, most people are drinking to cover up a problem, to cover up other pain. Uh, and if you just take, if you stop drinking and start smoking weed, there is a, you are just substituting the drug. Uh, so there's that. But I don't have any massively strong feelings on it. Um, you're welcome, Maria. Keep coming back, Maria, yeah? I want to make sure you, you pop up in this, this feed at least a couple of times a week. Let's do this together, okay? We'll support each other. Filippi uh, was sober two months but relapsed um, because of the missing out feeling. Can you help me with that to avoid it in the future? When I see other people in a good mood with wine in their hands, it's, um, it's hard sometimes. Yeah, I understand what you mean. Um, The thing I always say to people, if you, you know, if you have to go to a social occasion and you're worried about it and you're thinking, oh, my God, it's like going to be five hours long. How am I going to survive five hours uh, of people drinking and not join them? Look, do, just do one thing for me. When you go to a party, when you go to a social occasion where people are drinking, commit to the first hour. All right. Just say to yourself, I'm just going to do one hour here. Right. Because I believe that if you're at a party where everyone's drinking after one hour, you will start to see enough negative consequences of alcohol that will convince you that you don't want to join them. Initially, it looks like it's great fun. Everyone's laughing and giggling and there's oh champagne. Yes, please. Blah, blah, blah. So on like that. After about an hour. People start saying stupid things. People start slurring a little bit. People start embarrassing themselves. People start saying the same story over and over again because they can't remember that they've told it. Their friends laugh in exactly the same place as the previous three times they've heard it. And after a few hours of this mentality, you're thinking, nah, I don't need this. Uh, and also remind yourself that there's, there's nothing quite as beautiful as the smug feeling you will feel in the morning, especially if you ring around your friends and see how they're feeling. There's nothing better than knowing that all your friends feel terrible and you're bright as a button. <laughs> um, and the other thing is, um, Philip, um, some things you just don't go to anymore because it is just about the alcohol. You know, um, it's like lots of things in life pretend to be about something they're not it's like wine and cheese nights do you think it's is it even slightly about the cheese no it's about the wine isn't it it's just an excuse some things um are not fun if you don't drink and therefore you shouldn't go so don't don't be afraid to opt out of certain things because they're no longer fun it's, you don't have to force it anymore some other things will replace them if you just got to go looking for them and that takes a bit of effort because it's not as easy to find things that don't have alcohol in them. But you will find other things that are just as much fun, but in a different way. Uh, I'm not sure why, Slavi. What, is, what, is, uh, what browser are you using? Slavi says he's having trouble trying to connect live. Uh, I believe it only works on Chrome. doesn't work on Safari. Uh, let me see. Uh, can I post this up here? Try this link I'm posting now, Savvy. There we go. All right. Last couple of questions. Um, Uh, let's have a look. Todd, 
Beer tastes like the best thing ever, yet somehow I still remember the first time I tasted it when younger and it tasted foul. Yeah, that's what I mean. This this drug takes, you have to put a lot of effort in to get addicted to it because it tastes disgusting. Um, and some people argue with that. A lot, a lot of people say to me, no, Craig, I'm not having that. Uh, alcohol tastes fantastic. You know, there's nothing better than a good bottle of wine uh, with a meal. Yeah, but that, that's not true. Alcohol tastes revolting. It's just that the drink ma drinks manufacturers have to come up with increasingly creative ways to cover up the taste of the drug. That bottle of Merlot that you think is so fantastic with its pretty bottle, its expensive label, and its expensive price tag is a drug delivery mechanism. It's a product designed to hide an addictive substance within it. That's all it is. In the same way that cigarettes are nicotine delivery mechanisms, bottles of wine and bottles of beer are alcohol delivery mechanisms. They're just there to deliver the drug to you. You know, how do we get alcohol? Well, if you take a load of vegetables, fruit and vegetables, you throw them in a bucket and you leave them there to rot, then they will ferment. And as the skin of the fruit ruptures, the discharge that oozes from this rotting vegetable matter is alcohol. Pretty disgusting. I don't know who the first person who was that looked at that and went, I'm going to drink that. But it's, it's basically what happens when food rots. And you take that poison, and it is a poison, it's a registered poison, and you put it in a sugary drink, and everyone goes, yeah, it's amazing. Well, you know, when you're a kid, you first... You taste, you get your first taste of it. That's what it really tastes like. It's just you condition yourself over years of drinking to ignore the real taste. It's amazing the effort we go to to get addicted to this nasty, evil drug, isn't it? Thank you, uh, says David. You're welcome. Uh, Kat, uh, you're funny. Uh, I guess I'm logical, so I appreciate logical people. Uh, you had me at uh, uh, attractively packaged poison. It's what it is. It's all it is. It's poison in a pretty bottle. Uh, Garp, so once you quit drinking, when do you start to feel better? That's different for everyone. Um, and it's best not to put a timeline on it. Because if I say to you, oh, it's it's one month, Garp, then if you don't feel better after one month, you're going to say, well, uh, Craig lied to me. This is, I don't feel any better at all to go back to the drinking. Uh, I've had people who feel better within two weeks. I've had people complaining after three months that they don't feel any better at all. Uh, it's somewhere in between. But you should be able to see significant differences uh, in your health and your well-being within within three weeks, a month. And then it's like all I can tell you from my point of view is um, the whole time I was drinking, I was borderline high blood pressure. I was always at the point where they were just about to put me on um, medication for my blood pressure. Within one month of stopping drinking, my blood pressure had not only reduced, it had come down to completely normal levels within one month of quitting drinking. I had a, a pain in my, in my right flank, and I was terrified that I'd done something serious to my liver. Um, and they never really worked out what it was. Uh, I had lots of scans and tests and CT scans and ev everything, and I was really worried about it. Uh, and it was this kind of dull ache in the right-hand side of my body that just never went away. And within three months of stopping drinking, it went and never came back. So it's different for everyone. Uh, but just trust me, you will feel better when you stop drinking poison. Now there's logic for you. Um, Marshmallow says weed stops me from drinking every day. Okay, but why do you want? Why do you need the weed? What are you covering up? And if you want a long-term solution, address that. Now you can go back to weed after that if you want to, but I would encourage you to address the problem that makes you want to take drugs to cover cover it up. You'll feel a lot healthier and happier uh, if you do that. Uh, Jan, 
my son still won't talk to me even though I stopped drinking. It depends on how long you've been stopped for, Jan. I don't know your personal situation. Uh, you know, don't forget that our friends and our family have heard us say many times, uh, I promise I'm stopped, I've stopped drinking. I promise I won't drink again. I promise, I promise, I promise. Especially your partners. Um, and uh, pro as problem drinkers, often we become the boy who cried wolf. And it does take a, a bit of time for them to see that we're, we're, you know, we're walking the walk, not just talking the talk. So you just keep going, keep doing it, keep demonstrating that you have changed. Uh, and eventually you'll get through. Okay, we, we're approaching an hour, so I'm going to wrap up soon. Uh, I'll be back on Wednesday, same time, uh, 2 p.m., uh, UTC, which is also GMT as well. Let's give someone the last word. Um, let's give Michelle the last word. Michelle Guzmano, I drank to relieve anxiety, but it made it worse. Yeah, uh, it does. Alcohol causes anxiety. Uh, that's how it motivates you to drink. It basically says to you, um, you got anxiety, I can help you with that. Here, drink this. And then it gives you more anxiety but, and it teaches you repeatedly that your solution to anxiety is to drink alcohol. So then every time you feel anxious, you drink alcohol. So the alcohol creates more anxiety because it knows you're going to use alcohol to fix the anxiety. And you see what happens here? This is a cyclone. And a lot of people get in touch with me and say, I want to stop drinking, but how will I cope with my anxiety? The alcohol is causing your anxiety. They're two separate things. If you have anxiety before you started drinking, then now you have anxiety plus the alcohol, which is making more anxiety. You see what I mean? So stop drinking, then go and see your doctor to talk about your anxiety. Then separate the two things and get this poison out of your life. So thank you so much for being with me today. Back Wednesday. Uh, 2 p.m. GMT. And if you're new to the channel, hit that subscribe button, hit the like button and ring the bell so you get a notification uh, when I'm broadcasting again. Thank you so much for keeping me company today. It really helps to be here with you. Uh, let's do this together. Thanks a lot. See you soon. Imagine waking up tomorrow. No hangover. No feelings of guilt or regret. Just full of energy and vitality. That goal is not only possible, it's easily achievable. Find out how 200,000 people just like you have rediscovered their happy, sober lives using the Stop Drinking Expert program. Reserve your place on today's free Quit Drinking webinar and get a copy of my best-selling book, Alcohol Lied to Me, as a free gift just for turning up.